I look at the testing system that I hear about in schools today and um, I'm not saying better or worse than, I just find it a little difficult to understand from where I come from for uh, how I was educated, and maybe some of you who are uh, my age might uh, understand or relate to what I'm, what I'm talking about. You know, in many instances, I hear that you know, um, in, in, in general overall testing in a lot of schools, you, you get a chance to do the test over again. If you didn't get a good grade the first time, you, you get to do it over again. Or you get bonus questions so that on one test you can kind of boost your average for all the other tests. Or the class teacher makes up all the tests for their own class, or the student gets the test ahead of time. You know, we're going to pre-test, we're going to practice the test, and then we're going to give the test. You know? And I guess that's maybe the thinking of modern education. I'm not sure, I'm not in a position to say. Maybe I just don't understand the new method of teaching, uh, not necessarily teaching, but testing, because uh, I come from a different age, as many of you uh, do as well. Uh, I can remember uh, in school, primary school, secondary, high school, uh, the teacher gave tests on a weekly basis over everything that had been taught that week. Friday was test day. You got, you know, first period was religion, of course, I went to Catholic school, second period was math, third period was English, blah, 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 geography, you know, and Friday was test day. You were tested over the stuff you did uh, that particular week. Uh, no study sheets, no bonus points, you had to review and study your notes and the book carefully in order to pass the test. And the teacher kept track of that. And then at the end of the semester or the block, the principal's office would send tests for all subjects and all grades. And again, no one got to see the test, not even the teachers. You know? uh, the goal here was to have an objective evaluation of both the student and the teacher by the principal. Seems normal to me, seems somehow good management. And then at the end of the school year, the school board would be the ones who would send the final exams for all the subjects for every grade for every school. Um, these tests covered the entire year's material. So what you would study is you know, the, the weekly test that you had and you, know, you would study those because the, the test at the end for geography or English was over the whole year. Nobody knew what was in the test. Not, not the principal, not the teachers. As a matter of fact, the way we knew the tests that were coming from the school board, they were printed. And the tests that came from the school, they were done on, the, you know, on the, the alcohol cop copiers. Remember those? Used to smell, maybe you get a little courage to write the test, but anyways, they used to smell of alcohol. And they were blue, I remember, they were blue. And, and the tests that came from the regional, you know, from the from the school board, they were actually printed black and white. That's how we knew. And they, I, I still remember they were in a, you know, an envelope. It was sealed. The principal would come by, you know, grade five, grade six, whatever, and would give the sealed envelope to the teacher. Teacher would rip it open, hand out the test. And the goal here was to test the entire system to see if everybody was doing their job. And some people failed. Now, this approach might seem a little harsh by today's methods. But I can tell you, as one who went through this system as a student and then as a teacher, uh, you had to know your stuff to get an A. You know, you, you really, the guy who got the A, the girls who got the A, it's because they really knew the material. And many people did get A's and B pluses. You, you also got a little taste of the real world early on in your education because in the real world, they don't give you a makeup exam. In the real world, they don't give you the answers ahead of time. The boss gives you a problem to solve, he doesn't give you the answer to the problem. That's why he's paying you. You solve the problem. And in the real world, they don't let you pad your resume with bonus points. Now you may be wondering, you know, where, am I, where am I going with, is this, you know, are we reminiscing tonight, no sermon? Here's my point. I believe that the way we test in school in the modern age doesn't really prepare young people for the kinds of tests that they're going to have to face in real life. 
You see, in real life, you were tested every single day, and the tests are not easy. As Christians, we need to be aware of the fact that the tests that we face each day are not like the student-friendly tests and methods employed in many schools, maybe not all, because the stakes are much higher and the requirements to pass much more, uh, are much more strict. Now, understand that being tested is a sure thing for everybody. Everybody gets tested. No one escapes, no one can buy their way out with bonus points, and you don't know when these tests are going to come up in your life. You just have to be ready for them. Now I can't do a whole lot to bring back the testing methods of 50 years ago in schools, and teachers, because we have a lot of teachers here in our congregation and those who work for the system, don't, don't take my soapbox preaching on educational methods, you know, don't take it personally. I know that teachers also have to work with a system that they don't always agree with, but they have to follow the, the rules that they're, you know, that they're given. I, I can't do much about school testing, but I think I can help you to be ready for life testing, which each of you, young and old, have and will experience sooner or later. And perhaps the best way to start is to begin by describing the types of tests that occur in everyday life, because not all tests are the same. For example, there's the right or wrong test. Right or wrong test. This is probably the most common test that people face every single day. Is it right, is it wrong? Young or old, men or women, rich or poor, whoever you are, each day you're faced with many decisions that involve doing what is right or doing what is wrong. Sometimes it's little things like telling a little white lie you know, to avoid speaking to somebody on the phone that you don't want to speak to. You know, Shh, tell them I'm not here. You know. Sometimes it's a decision that could have grave consequences. For example, driving your car after you've consumed alcohol, or pursuing a relationship with a person who is not your spouse. You know, the latest revelation that website Ashley Madison in the news, a website dedicated to pairing up married people so that they can have adulterous affairs. Imagine, imagine the foolishness of giving this website your credit card information. <laughs> and now somebody has hacked into that website and is revealing the names of those people 38 million users. I mean, 38 million users. That in itself is appalling. What a statement about our society. Maybe the test is spreading gossip or slandering another person, especially a brother or a sister in Christ. The list goes on and on, but you know what I'm talking about. Each day you have to choose between thoughts and words and actions that are either right or they're wrong. This is one type of test that everyone faces, but especially Christians have to face because we care about what's right or wrong. Some people don't care right or wrong. Some people it's about what I want. Some people who are not people of faith, they don't care right or wrong, how it looks. It's what I want. What will gratify you know, my needs? But as Christians, we're, you know, we're invested in holy living, so we want to know what's right or wrong. We want to choose right. And we're tested every day. Another kind of test is the how long test. How long test. As I say, not every test in life is one that examines your moral standing, just like not every test in school is about math. 
Sometimes what is tested is our endurance. How long can we endure pain or frustration or disappointment or just waiting and not doing anything, just waiting? How long can we do that without losing our grip, without losing our faith, without losing our attitude of love? How long? You know, as a minister, I've seen my share of people who are being tested by various trials and tragedies of life, and I've seen many similarities in their reactions. For example, people who are tested, you know, the how long test, many of them are surprised. <laughs> you know, they felt that they would never be tested in this way, and they're caught completely off guard when something bad happens to them. And they usually say things like, well, this was not supposed to happen to me. Or life was not supposed to work out this way. Or I didn't think that you know, this would be me. You know, there's other people, but me? They're like surprised. It's almost like a student in school being surprised and insulted because the teacher hands them a test to, to see if they know the math or the spelling or whatever. People are surprised because they're being tested. Many people uh, react by being upset. You know, they see the testing of their endurance as something that is not fair and a waste of time and a waste of energy. They're angry at God or themselves and they feel robbed. They feel persecuted. Regardless of the situation, the how long test is usually the toughest because as frail human beings, we are aware that time is precious. And so to have our life suspended by illness, or sadness, or trouble, or other impediments is difficult because we only have so much time and we don't like wasting our time on suffering. And so we go around upset, mad, disappointed, because we're in the middle of the how long test. Sometimes our entire life is just the how long test. See, we don't get to decide the tests that we face. We, we don't decide that. Then there's the uh, which way test. You know, right or wrong test, how long test, then which way test. Now this test is difficult because it's not based on right or wrong or suffering, but rather a choice of options. For example, do I move to Ohio to take the new job or do I stay here? Or do we get married now or do we wait? Or should I go to college or should I work for a while first? See, there's no moral issue here. It's, I got options. The which way test is frustrating because we like black and white choices where we can pretty much see the results up front when we make the decision. And unlike other tests, we have to make which way decisions for other people at times. For example, should I place my aged father in a nursing home or should I care for him myself? And, and, and this makes the test twice as difficult to pass because it's not just about me, it involves somebody else. So now, you know, there are other types of tests in life. I've only mentioned three. The right or wrong test, the how long test, the which way test. I've also said that everyone takes these tests, but only Christians have the ability and the knowledge necessary to pass these tests. For example, take the right or wrong test. Unless the decision about what is right or wrong is, ba is, is based on what Jesus has taught, you cannot consistently choose right over wrong. If the only information you gather to make your right or wrong decision uh, uh, is something other than Christ's word, you're, you're going to have a hit or miss situation for most of your decision making. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse uh, 48, Jesus 
alludes to this right or wrong test. And he says, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father Himself who sent me has given me commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that His commandment is eternal life, therefore the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. And so Jesus says that His words, His teachings, His commands, they come from God and will serve as the basis for judgment you see the point there? The test, the judgment, it's going to be based on the words of Christ, not the words of man. You know, the Supreme Court of this country has deemed legal all kinds of things that are wrong in the eyes of God. And so you might, uh, you know, do the things that are lawful and legal in the U.S. of A, and no one will say anything to you here, but when your life is going to be judged by God, the judgment is not going to be based on the decisions of the justices. The decision and the judgment will be based on the word of God. And so if we want to make consistently right decisions, we have to base them on God's word. And this knowledge has a direct impact on our daily lives, especially when trying to discern what is the right way or what is the right thing to do or say. You know, I mentioned the Supreme Court, you know, the decision whether homosexuality is acceptable or not doesn't rest with public opinion or lobbying efforts by gay rights activists. Homosexuality is wrong because through the apostles, Jesus has called it indecent and an error, just in one place in Romans chapter 127. I always, I always smile when I, when I hear defenders of the gay lifestyle, gay marriage, so on and so forth, who think they are religious and who think they know the Bible say, well, I dare you to find anywhere where Jesus you know, himself condemned homosexuality. Well, I dare you to find anywhere where Jesus condemned smoking crack. You know what I'm saying? But we know that the apostles, who were they speaking through? Who's, you know, in whose mind were they, you know, what was in their mind? What were they remembering when they were teaching about marriage, when they were teaching about uh, sexual purity, when they were teaching about whatever they were teaching? In whose name were they teaching? Their own name? Well, no, they were teaching in the name of the Lord. Why? Because the Spirit brought to remembrance everything that He taught them. And so they simply passed it on and recorded their teaching for us today. So when I'm reading in Romans chapter one and Paul is denouncing homosexuality, for example, I'm also reading that Jesus is denouncing homosexuality and using Paul, his apostle, as the mouthpiece. Anyone who has a basic understanding of the Bible, understands that. And so each day we're faced with choices to tell the truth or to lie for advantage, to forgive from the heart or carry on the hatred, to indulge in improper sensual pleasure or to exercise self-control. The only way to choose right consistently is to know what Jesus has to say about the wrong and the right way to go. This knowledge doesn't guarantee that you have the strength and the maturity to follow through. You know, just because I know what's right, just because I know what Jesus says, doesn't mean I automatically have the strength to do that all the time, but at least I know what the target is. At least I know what I'm shooting for. With Jesus, you always know what's right. You always know what's wrong. And the same is true for the, the how long test. You know, people persevere in trial for a lot of different reasons. Some are afraid to die. They hang in there because they don't want to die. Some don't have a choice. Some people persevere, they don't have a choice. You, you, you have cancer, what are you going to do? You can't wish it away, you have cancer, you have to endure. 
or some people hang in there because they hope to have a, you know, a better time in the future, or they see it as a chance to develop character and strength, you know, a kind of a, a, a stoicism. But all of these methods of coping with the how long test don't produce what the test is originally designed to produce, and that is spiritual maturity. James, the epistle writer, says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. It's a, you know, a trial is a waste of time for a person who's a non-believer because all it will produce is simply a period of suffering. And perhaps uh, the individual kind of uh, has developed a, a stoic uh, sense of suffering, but it doesn't produce spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity comes to those who believe in the spirit. In another passage, James continues to talk about testing. He said, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, that's the how long test, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James 1, 12. How do I show Jesus I love him? I persevere in trial faithfully. That's how I show him that I love him. I love you, Lord. And this thing that's happening to my body, whether it's an illness, or this thing that's happening to my life, whether it's some sort of trial, or I lost my job, or you know, my boss is mean to me, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever's happening to my life that's making my life difficult, Lord, I'm bearing it, but I will not lose faith in you. I will continue to love you, Lord. That, that, that's spiritual maturity. You know, without Christ, a trial is merely an interruption in life, and the shorter the period of suffering, the better. After all, life is short, and we don't want to waste time with illness or trouble, for those who don't believe. For the Christian, however, the how long test not only measures faith, but it also strengthens faith and it creates a stronger assurance that faith in Jesus is not in vain. For Christians who persevere in trials, it no longer matters how long the difficult period lasts. What matters is if they remain faithful to Christ or not. They're playing the game at a way, a different level. Win or lose, is this cancer going to take me out? then let it take me out praising the name of Jesus. Will I be healed from this cancer? If I'm healed from this cancer, I will go on life praising Jesus. But either way, either way, I'm not letting go of the Lord. I'm not letting go. Faithful Christians don't simply pray for the trial to end or continually ask how long they have to endure. Their concern is faithfulness, no matter how long things go. The prayer is, Lord, please help me with the suffering, but more importantly, Lord, please hang on to me. Don't lose me in this. Don't let me get lost in the pain. Don't forget me, Lord. And don't let me forget you, Lord. With this view and prayer, they pass the test with flying colors and they receive the prize of faith, which is eternal life. What is the prize of faith? Eternal life. Where the question, how long, will never be asked ever again. The beauty of passing the how long test is that you never have to pass that test ever again once you've passed it. And then finally there's the which way test. Solomon says there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death, Proverbs 16, 25. And then Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, 
John 14, 6. Now, the tests that force us to go right or left, north or south, faster, slower, they all seem arbitrary and are usually decided usually by self-interest as the bottom line, right? So you know, a lot of times we say, well, what's, what's the best for me in this decision to take the new job in Ohio? You know, what's in it for me if I go to Ohio? Or what will I like better? Which will suit me best? Which will give me more pleasure? Which will uh, give me greater advantage or prestige? That's kind of the way many times we, you know, we decide the which way test. Which way will be best for me? But Solomon tells us that no matter how many angles you look at it in deciding which way, the way you finally choose will lead to ultimate death or destruction. Now this is because every way not given by God is a dead end, and I do mean dead end. Jesus, on the other hand, reveals that the one way that leads to victory over ignorance and death is Himself. He Himself is the way. It's interesting to note that in the very early days of the faith of the church, the Christian religion was referred to as the way. We are members of the way. We belong to the way, Acts 24, 14. In a modern sense, when confronted by the which way test, the only answer to seek is which way would the Lord Jesus have me go? That's the way I want to go. It isn't about Ohio, it isn't about the new job, it's about, Lord, do you want me to do this? For those who have become Christians, every decision is a test to see if they are ready to let Christ use their talents and their opportunities, use their relationships and their resources to further His will and His kingdom here on earth. So the, 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 the question is, Lord, which way would you have me go? And the, the, hard, the hard part about this is that in the which way test, uh, there's the component of waiting. We don't like to wait. We fill out a complaint card at McDonald's if the, if, if the burger arrives later than four minutes after we ordered it. We, we live in a fast, you know, let's go, rush, we want it now, instant gratification. Back in the day, you know, a new series on TV would come and you know, it would last 13 weeks or 26 weeks and if we wanted to find out who killed JR or who did the deed, you know, we had to wait week after week after week, we couldn't record it, you know, those things, you know, I'm, maybe I'm stuck in the past, but anyways, today, you know, today, and I'm guilty, like you, you know, we binge watch, oh, the new series is on, all right, grab a bucket of popcorn and a gallon of drink and sit down and let's go. You know? And you're saying to each other, after you've viewed nine episodes, do we go for one more? But it's two in the morning, I'll go just one more, right? <laughs> Isn't that what we do? And that's okay, it's entertainment. We're allowed to be entertained, we're allowed diversion. Sure, watch your TV the way you want to watch your TV. But remember that life isn't like that. It doesn't work like that. And Christian life certainly doesn't work like that. Because in Christian life, in the life of discipleship, waiting is a very important component that God uses in every Christian's life. So we pray, which way, Lord? But we have to be ready to wait for Him to show us the answer in order to demonstrate our faith. It's easy to know who passes this test, the ones who believe and are humble enough to ask the Lord which way and then wait for His answer, they've already passed the test even before they've taken a single step. And so, if you remember anything from this lesson tonight, remember this, every day you are tested, every day. You're tested to see if you will do the right thing in big or little matters. 
you're tested to see if you will remain faithful and hopeful and loving for one more day, for one more hour, for one more minute, despite what you're going through. And you're tested to see if today you will say to the Lord, here I am, Lord. Use me, send me, lead me to where you want me to go. Because it isn't my life, Lord, it's your life. Every day he tests and every day he waits for your reaction. That's what Christian life is like. So ask yourself, please do ask yourself, how am I doing? Ask yourself, do I know that I'm being tested? Ask yourself, am I making an effort? And for those who are not Christians, there's also a test and it's the same test every day. Every day he tests your heart to see if you will finally let him in. You can pass this test once and for all by calling on his name for forgiveness in repentance and in baptism. And so if you need to let Jesus in, or if you need prayer to have better test results, then we invite you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.